Welcome, ladies, and congratulations. Um, I think my first question has to be for all of you about perceptions of the suffrage movement, because, I mean, this is an incredible story, and it seems to me astonishing that it hasn't really been tackled by cinema before. And I just wondered, why do you think that is? Um, let's start with Sarah. <laughs> Well, yeah, no, we pondered that question for a long time. When we were talking to the academics who consulted on the film, they said they weren't surprised. It took ages to get um, women's history taken seriously in the academy. It took a long time to get it on the school curriculum. I wasn't taught anything about it and um, later read a few lines at the bottom of a history book. And I think it's partly a symptom of inequality and the fact that these stories have been written out of our history. And also the fact that it hasn't been on the big screen must be to do with... The, I was having so few female teams, and it probably was going to be a female team that brought it to the screen. Has anyone else got anything to say about that? Um, I mean, I think when you realise that the public records that revealed the level of police surveillance of um, this organisation weren't open until about 2002, 2003, that you realise that this has been something that has been suppressed and denied. So for us, I think it's been a real detective story. Uh, job to kind of unpick all the research. We've had an incredible body of um, historians who've sort of led that, but you come to realise that so many of these stories have been buried. Uh, and like Sarah, I was never taught it at school, although I have an 11-year-old girl who two years ago went for a dress-up day and there were two suffragette girls, so I think that's quite reassuring. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that there was some um, resistance to suffragette as a title initially. Is that true? And why do you think that was? No, I think we, we endlessly debate titles. Titles are so difficult. <laughs> but we're pleased that it's called that because it's clear. <laughs> <laughs> um, Carol, well, it's clear. It's clear here, maybe. Yeah. But um, to a modern, young, unschooled audience, they might think suffragette has something to do with suffering. <laughs> we have heard that. And it does. <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> But yes, people don't understand the word, actually, mm. sometimes. That's true, yeah. Uh, Carrie, how much did you actually know about the suffrage movement when you started, and how much did you learn through researching? Uh, I knew relatively little. Like Sarah, I didn't have much. Mm. I remember there was a small paragraph in a history book saying the women's movement, and it was about four lines just saying... They got it, basically, after a bit of fighting, and it was really um, brief, and I had lots of sort of images of women politely marching through the streets, holding banners, and, you know. So I, I knew relatively little, and reading the script was like, I remember Googling as I went, thinking, is this real, did this happen? Did, were they force-fed? They, did they go on hunger strike? And, you know, did this police brutality happen? And the surveillance was another huge surprise to me. So a lot of it was a, um, a huge learning curve, and then, and that continued through. I was attached to the film for about a year before we filmed, so we had a lot of time and, um, and, and it was and great. Then we went into rehearsals and Sarah and Faye had sort of put together this massive archive of research <laughs> and we were taking home homework every day and so it was, um, yeah, it was great to learn. Meryl, I mean, you're amazing in this iconic role. I mean, it's quite a small, but it's an integral part of the, of the film. I mean, is there any other feminist or heroine of yours you'd like to play now, having done Emily? <laughs> um, gosh. There are so many stories that haven't been told. Um, in fact, that's the sort of marked and important piece of this. There is no such thing as women's history. There's history that women have been shut out of. And... Uh, the brave souls who raise a, a banner and try to, to make it, to, to do some spelunking and, and find out about it. Amanda Foreman has a, a series on BBC um, called The Ascent of Woman, and it's a four-part series that we can't get sold in the United States because there isn't interest I think there's interest, but there's not interest in the people who make those decisions. So it's, it's um, a question of rousing that in interest. And um, I knew a great deal about the suffrage movement in the United States, but I didn't know much about it here. And I also didn't know the condition of women here in 1913. I didn't know that the marriage age was 12. That was shocking to me. Yeah, shocking. I didn't know that 
once a woman was married, she had no further claim to not only her name, but any property she brought to the marriage. Her own children were not hers. She had no say, really, in how they were raised, where they were educated, if they were educated, or if the 12-year-old was basically sold to be married off. I didn't know those things. For me, it's recent history. That's my grandmother was alive then, had uh, a couple of children, and was not deemed capable of voting. It's a, it's, I'm passionate about it. It means something to me. It feels recent. And I think the great achievement of this film is that it's not about women of a certain class, like Emmeline Pankhurst, who worked as an abolitionist, as, an anti, as a pro-labor supporter of uh, the rights of working people, men and women. But it's about a working girl. And I think that's part of why we can enter the film so easily and so empathetically, is because Carrie plays this young laundress who looks like us. And, but her, the circumstances of her life were out of her hands completely. And um, so uh, this is such an important movie. I couldn't agree more. Um, I think we're ready to take some questions from the audience. So can you raise your hands? OK. There's one there. Hi. Lucy Bannerman from The Times. Um, two parts to the question, if I may. First of all, for Kerry and Merrill, um, are there exam can you give us examples, please, of, sort of subtle modern-day sexism that still makes your, your blood boil? And um, also, is there a sense that sort of modern women, those of us who do have privileges that were unthinkable for women a century ago, in some way have let suffragettes down? There's lots of talk about feminism and inequality, but not as much sort of act, action, you know, to make things different for those less fortunate. So is there a sense of that in any way? I mean, I think, I think what I always loved about this film is that um, it didn't feel like a documentary about a time, it felt like a film about today, and it felt, I always felt its resonance with where we are, and it's a film to mark the achievement of what these women did and what they gave to us with, um, what they achieved, but also to sort of highlight where we are in the world. And of course, we still live in a society that's sexist, and um, and that goes through um, that goes throughout our history. Um, but I feel, yeah, I think it's a. I mean, I think for me, it was a great moment to realise, really understand what women went through to get the vote, and for, for me to be empowered, and and also to, to to sort of take another look at where we are today. And and you know, obviously in this country, largely we're very privileged. But you know, the fact that the film does relate to uh, and does talk about the rest of the world and where women are, and um, and just in terms of their vote, and not in terms of their living uh, wages, and and in terms of the you know, the way that they're treated and the, the marriage laws. And um, I think we always felt that bringing the film back around to today and trying to make people think about where we are in society now was, was the most important thing about the film. And just to give people an idea of the history and to, and to help them understand, but also to sort of open our eyes. And, and, and it's, been, it's really done that for me. Um, and I work with a charity called War Child, who work with children in conflict, and they work with lots of women and lots of children. And um, and I was at an event last night with them, and we all were actually Sarah and Faye and I. And, and a woman called Pauline from Uganda spoke, and she was 12 when she was kidnapped by the LRA, and she was kept as a child soldier for seven years, and she finally escaped. And she found War Child, who uh, who helped her and and helped her get back into school, and she learned to read and write, and she had her education, and she said. Education is empowerment. This is, you know, this is, they gave me my life back. They gave me my empowerment. They, um, you know, and she spoke with such passion about what learning meant to her. And um, I think that just brought it home again for us tonight, you know, last night about, you know, what this film can mean to people. I, I, I completely concur with all of that. I mean, I, I think... Sometimes things are circular. The less you see of stories about the civil rights of women or the importance of women 
in history or what they achieved, if you don't see them, you are disheartened and you think, well, this is the way it always has been. Um, but to make a film like this, it will circle the globe. It will encourage people that have very little hope, people whose lives look almost like the lives in 1913 in, in, in London. Um, so yes, I think it's a, it's a great encouragement. Is there sexism uh, in, in the world now? <laughs> Um, the lack of inclusion in the decision-making bodies in every single enterprise in the world. Whether it's what to do with refugees, why are the, the people making those decisions not half women, what to do about um, I mean, that the, the church is a body that excludes it. Two places you can't vote in the world. Saudi Arabia, although they're registering people, supposedly, and the Vatican. Um, that seems wrong to me. It, it, if um, men don't look around the board of governors table and feel something is wrong, something's just wrong, when half the people there are not women, then we're not, we're not going to make any progress. Because we're making progress from the bottom up. We're coming to, in the, in the United States anyway, more than half the people that are in graduate schools, law schools, medical schools, more than half are women. Business schools. But do they get to decide? Do they get to write history? No. Uh, good morning, ladies. Claire Bueno from Premier Scene. Um, what I wanted to ask was there's such a strong sense of solidarity between these women within the film. How did you work together to create that solidarity amongst you to bring that truth to the big screen? And a question to all of you, please. <laughs> Well, we had this cast, and none of them had worked together before. I think I'm right about that. But when we got together to rehearse, and we had three weeks of um, sitting in a room with Abby and um, going through the script and really discussing it, and Kerry had done months and months of preparation before that, um, they all immediately formed this bond. I had nothing to do with it. They became great friends. In fact, one of the problems was stopping them laughing and getting back to work. But um, So that was, that was them and there was an unusual sense of camaraderie and I wonder whether it was because well one we were telling the story everybody felt very passionate about but also there was this unusual balance um, we had men and we had lots of women in, in, in key positions and that was exciting and it was also exciting to have lots of women on screen together you know often you'll have Meryl or Kerry but not in the same, same scene so that was all incredibly exhilarating for all of us I think <laughs> interesting in terms of a collaboration um, when you work with actors so early on in this way and it's quite rare to get that length of rehearsal period with actors in film I'm used to it in theatre but not in film is that you make it as bespoke as you can for those actors but also you start to listen to them because they are the keepers of character and one of the things that's very interesting to me is that the great quote we use was no genius moment on my part it was actually Kerry Mulligan who found it and I think that's when great work happens, is when you truly start to collaborate with the intelligence and brilliance of actors and say, when they discover you st stuff and start to bring it into the work again, it was, it was really amazing and it's a beautiful end to that film. And I couldn't... Olive Schreiner. At Olive the Schreiner at the end quote. And, and I struggled to find that. And so it really was down to the actors who collaboratively together really understood the themes of the film and I think um, had journeyed their way through it. So for me, that was a really wonderful collaboration. Okay, this, this one here. Hello, Neil Carey from CNN. I'm privileged to be the first male voice uh, here. <laughs> um, when you look around the world, who do you see are the Emily Pankhursts of today? Uh, to all the panel, please. Malala Yousafzai, yeah. right away. 
Yeah, we saw a documentary about her when we were together in America, and it was striking how there were echoes. I mean, you know, she's, she's endured so much, and she's so brave, um, but there were, in terms of her language and the way her outlook and her determination, there were many echoes. Hi, my name is Akua from the British Blacklist. Um, there's been a bit of the backlash about the Rebel Slave T-shirt, and I wanted to know, was it true, um, I'm directing this to Abby, um, was it true that Miss Pankhurst borrowed her rather be a rebel than a slave line from the anti-slavery movement? And if so, was it considered to at least reference the contrib contribution of black women also joined in the struggle for female equality? And to Ms. Streep, um, could I ask about your female, female, female filmmaker initiative? that you're supposed to be heading this year. Thank you. I think what's been fascinating for me, and I've just spent the last month in America, is to compare the difference between the British suffragette movement and the American suffragette movement. And certainly in America, we have a huge debt to the many diverse women who are part of the movement. Um, I think in the UK, without a doubt, there is that association. However, I think it would be a pity if the negative connotations of that conversation, and it is an important conversation, overshadowed the true and sincere intentions of the film, which was to empower all women globally to believe in the, uh, the, the um, equality for all women. And so in a way, I think that to me is the really important narrative. But actually, I think the discourse is really important. And I hope that we don't negate on either side that discourse because it is vital that we keep talking about it. Okay. And on your scheme. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> Um, yes, and the question about the, um, the playwriting, I mean the screenwriting consortium that was held. We had a competition run through Women in Film in New York, and um, there were many, many submissions, so many that we're going to do it again next year and next year and next year. But it was really for women over the age of 40 who are often shut out of, um, of the competition and uh, out of uh, getting their films greenlit. So I wanted to make that happen, make that happen. Um, there were eight finalists. The winner was uh, a woman from Austin, Texas, and now she's uh, working on getting that film made. Hi, my name is JC Anderson. I'm from For Your Excitement. I just wanted to know how much uh, resistance you encountered in actually bringing the story to the screen and, and, and getting the project off the ground. Who's the question to? Um, to Abby and Sarah. I'm, uh, well, I mean, I, I think Sarah can... I mean, Sarah and I have been on this project together for six years, but it's truly Sarah's passion project for the last decade, so that gives you some idea. Film does take time. However, I think a film where... Uh, it's fronted not by one, but an ensemble of women, and they're not being funny, is hard. <laughs> and it's not romantic, is hard. And so um, I think that became a huge obstacle. Um, we have an incredible uh, group of uh, producers at the front, uh, Faye Ward, Alison Owen, and our man, Cameron McCracken. Uh, and I think of all of them as feminists. And, uh, and so it really has take, taken both men and women to bring this film to the screen. Um, and for several reasons, and it's very complex, and I really would love to talk more about it, and I will be talking more about it when I talk more with the Fawcett Society about uh, a pay equality, so it will be an ongoing conversation. I don't know if Sarah wants to add to that. Yes, I think that's right. You know, as Abby says, it's, it's never easy, but this was a tough proposition, but we wanted to stick to our guns, and, and we pushed through all the obstacles, but we did have champions, and we had these really tenacious producers who were sitting in the front row. We had uh, champions, you know, Tessa Ross at Film 4 in the early days. We had people at Focus. We had Cameron McCracken at Pathé, who makes you know, political and exciting and interesting films and often directed by women. So that's, you know, we, we were lucky to have those people around us. Okay, two at the back there. Hi, Orla from News Talk in Ireland. Um, it's a question from Meryl. We lost one of our great playwrights last week, and um, I understand that you had spent a little bit of time with him, so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on Brian Friel. And secondly, I understand your roots were discovered to have been traced back to Donegal last year, and I just wondered whether you'd visited or met any of the relatives. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. 
I think that's probably why we're probably related in some way. Um, it was it was such a great loss because um, it made me think that when when a, a great playwright dies, it's not just his voice that's lost. It's all the people that he ever met in his life, all the people he ever imagined out of those lives. And um, thank God we have this wonderful body of work. Um, yes, I did spend an evening with him of which I have no memory. <laughs> <laughs> it involved dancing, I do remember. <laughs> And your roots to Donegal? Oh yes, uh, the strains. Um, so my grandmother that I mentioned before, her name was um, Mamie Wolf, and her mother was Mary McFadden, and her mother was Grace McFadden, nay Strain, and she had, I think, three children that she left here in, uh, I mean, in Ireland to come to the United States. She was only 15 and a half years old, leaving those children, but they were starving. And she'd given them all to each to different families. And she came and made a, a living as a coal miner <laughs> in Chunk Monk, Pennsylvania. I swear to God, that's a real thing. <laughs> and her name is Strain, and the reason I know because they're, it's a very unusual name, and there are only a few of them in Ireland, and they're all in Donegal, and uh, right in the town. Bally, oh God, I can't remember the, the name of the town right now, where uh, Brian Friel was from. Ksenia uh, Rudic, Cinemafia.ru. I was wonder why your character, Meryl, was like behind the scene, and actually, we see you in the movie just one time on the balcony. My question entirely, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, I gave her Iron Lady. Come on. <laughs> no, it was a question to Marilyn, to creators, if it was for purpose to hide you behind the scene and to show all these ladies that not only Emily Pankhurst was in the lead of this movement of the suffragette, or like what was the purpose yeah. of this? Do you want to go, you go for it, because I've talked. Yeah, well we, we talked about a biopic of Emily Pankhurst for, for a while, and there would be an amazing story to be told. I hope that out of this subject, it was a huge movement that spanned decades, I hope there are many more films, but, um, we thought if we, that, we told that story, it would be the story of an exceptional woman. What we were interested in was the story of the ordinary women, the women with no platform, no entitlement, the working class women who are so often at the vanguard of change, who rarely get talked about. And there were these extraordinary accounts, as, of, as we mentioned, but so contemporary feeling. And we thought it was to follow that woman would make it connect with women all over the world today. Oh, should I talk? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, um, I thought, yes, I I exactly. To sometimes history is written by the privileged class. And the interesting thing about film is that you can look deep into, into lives that weren't written about um, and imagine what they were like, knowing what we know about their conditions and what they were, uh, what they suffered. So I think, as I said before, the, the way in to connect with a modern audience is not to have people in big hats with corsets and who look different from us, who look almost alien, but to have girls that we identify, can more easily identify with. And it's, a, it's, a, it's an easier way in to the story to translate it to right now. Um, hello, uh, Kat Andreaco from Free Cinema GR. Uh, now let's talk about men for a moment. Uh -huh. um, the men in your film uh, are most of them quite actually quite sympathetic. So we don't see wife beaters. You seem to have a, a, a very lovely relationship and, uh, first with Ben Wisher's character. And then, of course, um, Helena Bonham Carter's husband is very supportive of uh, her actions. Um, what was the balance? Um, on that, how did you decide to go on with the male characters? And the question is to? Uh, mainly to Abby and Sarah, but... Yeah. 
Um, well, when we came to cast this film, it was very, very difficult because we kept on getting the call from agents saying the parts weren't big enough um, for the men. Um, uh, so it's a huge tribute to Brendan uh, Gleeson and Ben Wishaw and, and Sam West and Finbar Lynch that they took on these parts. So one of the things I really wanted to try and do, that, and, and certainly Sarah and I talked about this a lot, was to try and, although they are smaller and supporting, um, they are complex. I think it's really interesting you say that because one of the criticisms we have is that's come up is uh, there aren't any sympathetic men and they're not sympathetic to the women. And I think one of the things that's really interesting is I think they are all going on their journey. Uh, and one of their journeys, I think, certainly for Ben, is to deal with the, the fact that he's a man out of his time. For Brendan, he's a man who's trying to uphold the law and he then starts to question the law. For um, Benedict, I'm afraid there's very little enlightenment, but we do see very clearly that he's a man who controls the wealth of his wife. The Sam West And the Sam West character, and then... Her, um, wealth. her wealth. Her wealth, sorry, her wealth, her wealth more yeah. importantly. <laughs> uh, and then with Finbar Lynch, I wanted to create a man who would have been in the men's league at that time, who would have himself been incarcerated at some point, and the conflict of that, which is when your ideology starts to really... Um, be strained by your emotional love for your wife. So I think it was always our aim to try and get the balance of complex and yet supporting roles for the men. But I, I hope that there is, you know, you see the character of Taylor, who was very much an archetype, but in some ways I saw that again and again in the research, which was those men who sexually abused their workers from a very long, young age. And I think we have to assume, also based on the research I did, that Maud was abused from a very, very young age. So that's a very important facet in the film. And the Finbar Lynch character who's married to Helena was based on, there were three well-known couples where the men supported the women and um, there were a couple of men, well, there's George Lansbury who resigned because of the uh, forced feeding, but there were also a couple of men who did go, a few men who went to prison and even one who hunger striked. So we wanted to show, you know, there were all shades of men, as Abby said. Yeah. Uh, Carrie, I've got a question. I'm the most sympathetic character in the movie. Who's yes. that little boy? Oh, yeah, oh my God! <laughs> <laughs> it's just the ma magic. Um, Carrie, I've got a question for you. Um, I just wanted, to, having you know, immersed yourself in research, um, put yourself, you know, put yourself in the position of Maud. Do you think, you know, you now would you be a rock thrower or would you be a leaf litter? Oh, <laughs> that's so hard. Uh, yeah, I think about some of the things that they. One of the most shocking things to me was. Um, suffragettes who went into uh, museums and slashed famous works of art. And I think that is just, you know, they, they did, you know, lots of, um, you know, big protests, but that just seems so terrifying. And to have the guts to do that is just um, astonishing. And, and, and that's just this one tiny thing and all the sort of horrendous things they went through. Um, I think, you know, I've been so lucky to grow up in a in a, a generation where I haven't had to fight, on, or in a family at least, and in a, you know, in a sort of environment where I've had a very kind of lovely, easy upbringing, and, and I'm incredibly privileged in that respect, so I've never had to fight. And I think, I suppose, uh, what we feel about making the film and what we feel about people seeing it is that, you know, I suppose we fight for more equality, but we also fight for the people who aren't in our positions. And, um, and so I don't know if I would throw rocks for myself, I would like to think that I could throw a rock for somebody else. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a, I can't imagine the courage and, and uh, you know, the, the bravery that these women had. Um, it's just completely awe-inspiring. Okay, there's two there. Um, uh, Nico Hines, Daily Beast. Um, quick question for Meryl. Um, people have, have expressed disappointment um, at you disassociating yourself perhaps from being a feminist. I wonder if you stood by that. Um, and a question for Kerry. Um, it seemed to me that this film was a lot about radicalization and recruitment to a kind of radical cause. And did playing that role kind of remind you of all the things we've been reading in the papers about people now being recruited and radicalized for more nasty uh, radical causes? Um, <coughs> um. There's a phrase in this film that says, deeds, not words. And that's, that's sort of where I stand on that. I let the actions of my life stand for what I am as a human being. And contend with that, not the words. That's what I'd say. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah, I mean, of course, you know, but, but the idea of what they were fighting for wasn't radical. I mean, it was in the context of their time, but it wasn't at that time. This is 50 years after they'd been peacefully protesting for what they deserved, for basic human rights. And so what they were doing, you know, things they were doing were deemed outrageous and things they were doing were very risky to their own, um, to their own lives. And, and, of course, they, they made huge sacrifices and they put themselves in danger, and that was radical. What they wanted wasn't radical. Um, and I don't think you can... I don't, I don't see a relation between what is going on in, and I think what you're referring to. Um, I don't connect the two. I, I, that seems a completely... Um, a, a completely sort of different um, sort of... Sorry, I'm completely inarticulate about this. Well, but I'm trying to... the fact that they, um, under Emmeline Pankhurst, only did, never wanted to harm... Well, set out absolutely not to harm human life and no one died as a result of the cause yeah. except a few suffragettes themselves. Mm -hmm. And that was very clearly um, set out. Yeah. Yeah, so I just can't relate the two. I feel like the cause that they were fighting for was so um, basically pure and, and right, and it was a basic human right that they had been denied and people are still denied. So yeah. to, the fight is just so complete. I mean, it's just that you can't put the two in the same category. I think we've got time for a few more questions. Um, oh, this one there. Hi, I'm Andy Kay from Screen Relish. Um, what a terrific film Suffragette is and, and uh, how... How striking it is that you know, and how horrifying the situation that these women went through. Um, I suppose the paradox of the film, though, is that it's great that this film exists and it's portraying its message so effectively. But it's also sad that we're living in a society where this kind of message is still relevant. Um, so my question is: Are you guys? I mean, I mean, proof alone that you that it's you know that women can indeed exceed those the things that men can do. But are you not just baffled by some of the you know some of the people and some of the industries, the film being one of them? That, uh, that see women as secondary to, to men, that see them as inferior? I mean, are you, are you at me confused by that more than irritated and frustrated? Yes, it is baffling, isn't it? That, it's, uh, that the statistics year in, year out are so bleak, and just talking as a director, that it's, you know, 1% or between 1% and 10%. I'm excited that in the London Film Festival there are 46 films directed by... feature films directed by women. Um, <laughs> hooray! <laughs> 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 And, um, and, yeah, and we know it, it, that, that the women are half the population. They buy more than half cinema tickets, and they, there's an appetite for female-centric films or films made by women. So I, but I'm optimistic because <laughs> so many people are talk, now talking about it. There's a real... Um, it feels like for the first time that I feel when I walk into a room, people are receptive to the idea that, you know, yes, we do want to think about employing more women. So I think hopefully the tide is turning, and all of you can help that. <laughs> you, know, you know, in our business, part of it is driven by buzz. So I was always thinking, what, what makes buzz? You know, what, what, what controls that? In the United States, when people go to find a movie to watch at night, to go out to the movies, they go to something called Rotten Tomatoes. Maybe you don't have it here. You have it here? Yeah, it exists. All right. So I went deep, 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 deep into Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I counted how many contributors to Rotten Tomatoes, the people who, critics and bloggers and writers and uh, who, and there's a very strict set of criteria that allow you to be a blogger, critic or something. Um, and of those people that are allowed to r rate on the tomato meter, there are 168 women. And I thought, that's absolutely fantastic. And there are, if there were 168 men, it would be balanced. If there were 268 men, it would be unfair, but I would be used to it. If there were 368, if there were 468, if there were five, six, Actually, there are 760 men who weigh in on the tomato meter. Now, I submit to you that men and women are not the same. They like different things. Sometimes they like the same things, but sometimes their tastes diverge. If the tomato meter is slighted so completely to one set of tastes, that drives box office in the United States, absolutely. So who are these critics, bloggers, and thing? I went on the side of the New York film critics. The New York film critics are 37 men 
and two women. <laughs> and then I started to go on all the sites of the critics' thing. And it is, the word isn't disheartening, it's infuriating. <laughs> because people accept this as received wisdom. This is just the way it is. And you can take every single issue of feminine rights, female rights in the world, and um, examine it under this same rubric, because it isn't fair. So we need inclusion. We need inclusion. Rotten Tomatoes this year should say it has to be equal, half and half. I'm afraid this is all we've got time for now, so can you put your hands together and thank our talent? Ladies and gentlemen, you're watching Hey You Guys! Hey You Guys, huh? Hey you guys, is that yeah. from the Goonies? It is indeed, yeah. Nice. Hey You